everybody. Uh, it's four o'clock. We can start. Um, and I'm really, really happy that Jorge Volpi has been invited here uh, for us to find out a, a bit more about this really important Mexican writer who is definitely doing something different to, to a lot of the writing um, well, in Latin America or, or anywhere. Um, he was born, and maybe it's good if I give you a little brief introduction to him and to his already very considerable body of, of work. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion, and then you can also ask uh, any questions that, that you'd like to. Um, Jorge Volpi was born in Mexico City in 1968. And he, he came to prominence in the Mexican literary scene and the Latin American scene uh, in 1996. He was one of the founding members of the crack movement. Now, uh, don't jump to conclusions. This has nothing to do with uh, a drug of choice. <laughs> uh, I haven't asked Jorge that. Maybe you know we can find out later. But, uh, but actually, the name is the onomatopoeic word, crack, the English word. Uh, they used the word to describe their rupture from the previous Mexican generation, which was a generation which was much more enthralled to the, the writers of the boom, the, the Gabriel Garcia Marquez generation. So, um, and yet the, the name suggested a rupture, but uh, in fact, as the, the manifesto stated, it wasn't all about rupture. There was also continuity. In fact, the, the manifesto said there would be no rupture then, but continuity. And if there were any kind of rupture, it would only be with the chaff. So that's, that's good fighting talk for a manifesto anyway. And uh, since then, Volpi uh, hasn't been, uh, the, the crack movement is, is not really the defining feature. Um, he, Volpi has made his name with novels that, are, that are, could be seen as mutant texts, mixing fact and fiction, mixing real historical figures with uh, imagined uh, figures who tell us about the history or, or certain aspects. Science and history often combine, and, uh, and, the, and the, the novels also often look at a particular fascinating aspect of, uh, of, of history or, or contemporary um, ethical dilemmas as well. Uh, in one novel, In Search of Klingsor, which I believe has now been translated into 19 languages or? 25. Oh, right it's now. gone up <laughs> since I last looked, 25. <laughs> Next week, 30. Um, in, in, in Search of Klingsor, he, he explores human perspective and perception, and he does it with also an exploration of quantum physics. Uh, at the same time, there's a thriller scenario around a US scientist who after World War II visits Germany to try and discover the secret identity of a leading German scientist who was the Nazi scientific advisor. Uh, and uh, in Season of Ash, which foils have in their bookshop, uh, Chernobyl and the Human Genome Project are, 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 are part of, of, of this really interesting novel. And his most recent novel, uh, which is out in, interest, this is an interesting one. It, it seems to have appeared first in Spanish translation. Um, <laughs> And this Spanish translation is of uh, apparently an original uh, book by a New Yorker called J. Volpi. And uh, J. Volpi's book, uh, Deceit, has been translated into Spanish as Memorial del Engaño, perhaps a, a memorial to deceit. And it's, it's all about the world of leveraged finance and the subprime market crash that, and, and the, the, the economic system we have, and not only the current economic recent uh, woes that, that, that have, you know, have, have been uh, ma made such an impact on the last decade, but also going back to the, s the, the source of the, the, the economic framework that was established at the end of World War II, the IMF and the World Bank, and uh, through two generations of father and son, uh, this, this novel explores, uh, it's a con man, who, who has defrauded investors of $15 billion, and he is writing his, his, his memoirs uh, from a secret location where he's hiding from the law. But it is also uh, an investigation about his father, who, who was the assistant to uh, a, a true historical figure, um, 
who is who is fascinating, Harry Dexter White, a U.S. Treasury official who was uh, really really steered the Bretton Woods Agreement towards the IMF and World Bank as they became, but who it was later revealed was actually a, a, a Soviet spy. Um, so as you can see, the, these these interests in in history and and in and in finding uh, a way into it through fictional figures is is, is a is a something that comes throughout Jorge Volpi's work. Um, and uh, I don't know. I mean, the Human Genome Project, uh, modern finance, other chemistry. Um, what next? Is there anything left? <laughs> is there anything left in 20th century history, or for you to look at? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here today with this beautiful sunny afternoon in London, with us. Uh, thank you very much to the English Pen, and to the London Book Fair for the invitation to talk with my friend Stephen. We met in Mexico some months ago or some weeks ago, so I'm really happy to have this chat with you. Uh, well, I don't know exactly why I decided to write this cycle of novels uh, around the 20th century and the 21st century, dealing not only with these historical and fictional figures, but also with the main subjects and disciplines of these years. Uh, quantum physics in In Search of Klingsor, uh, psychoanalysis in The End of Madness, um, genomics and a little bit of artificial intelligence in Season of Ash, and in the last one, this uh, very complex economic world. But I think that this is um, the same project. I started this project almost 20 years ago, and I think that I reached the end of this project. So I'm writing also different kind of novels, more experimental, uh, shorter than these ones. Uh, for example, my new novel in Spanish is a very small novel in verse, mm. and is dealing with Mexican history, with a Mexican problem, the women traffic in Mexico. So it hasn't anything to do with this other historical and scientific fresco of the 20 and 21st centuries. That's fascinating. You say it's a novel in verse. Could it yes. also be called a long poem? Yes, it's a long oh. poem, but with characters and with right. a plot. So for me, it's more a novel in verse, uh, as Bikram said, novel, for example, than uh, a poem. Yeah. I'm not a poet. This is the first time I write in verse, but for me, it continues to be a novel. Mm. And what, what made you choose to, to, to write this novel in verse? Well, this is a very curious and strange project for me. I'm an opera fan, as you know, mm. because in my last novel, opera is everywhere. And also, I, this time, I wanted to try with another different kinds of arts. So I wrote an original plot around this awful subject, the traffic of women from Mexico, especially from a town in Mexico, in the state of Tlaxcala, to the United States. And after that, this project became three different projects in three different arts. So after that, I wrote an opera libretto for the same subject, and this opera called Cuatro Corridos was premiered in the United States uh, two years ago, and is going to be premiered in Mexico City next month. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also uh, an adaptation of this same story by the Mexican director David Pablos, uh, was torn into a movie that is going to be presented this year in two or three months. And I decided that the verse was exactly what I wanted for the literary version of this story that has these three different ways of exploding. Mm. So, so you wrote the libretto for the opera? I wrote the libretto for the opera. Uh, not the music? or Not the music, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and was the libretto in, in verse then? or Yes, the yeah. libretto was also in verse. Right in Spanish, in English, and in Nahuatl. 
Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you speak? No, I don't speak no. Nahuatl, but with the help of a translator. But the idea, it was a binational project between Mexico and the United States, with uh, four composers and one librettist, two American composers and two Mexican composers, and I wrote the libretto. Uh, each composer wrote the music for a monologue of four different women involved in this plot. Right. Yeah. Huh. I, I can't wait for the novel in verse. <laughs> when, when will it come out in Mexico? In September. In September. Yes, okay. and the, the movie in June and the opera in Mexico City in May. Okay. So more or less the mm. three projects. Yeah. Uh, well, so that is, that is where to go when you've <laughs> covered the 20th century as history. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds wonderful. Um, although you haven't left fact factual concerns behind in that, nor in, in, in other recent writing. I noticed recently on Twitter that you had written a story uh, from the point of view of the, the pilot, of the, the, or the co-pilot of the German Wings plane. Uh, and, and you wrote it very quickly after the, the, the disaster. Yeah. Were, you, were you worried that anyone would, would find that would be in bad taste? Or? Yeah, m maybe. And I had some readers that thought that and a lot of other readers that thought that it was the only way to try to understand what was happening on the mind of this co-pilot. Uh, I always thought that fiction is not only entertainment, but it's a tool to investigate reality. And we will never know exactly what this guy was thinking at the time of the crash. So I tried to be very cautious. I tried not to be in any way writing some lines with bad taste. I only tried to figure out what could be thinking at this moment. And I always thought that literature has this goal mm. to try to understand our minds, our souls. That's the main thing that fiction does that it couldn't be done in any other way. So is, is that the end, was that the end in itself really, that, that the story should help people to understand what, this, what might have been going on in this well, person's mind? Yes, one possibility. Yeah. It would be always a mystery, an unsolved mystery, why this pilot could do something like that. So fiction is the only way to figure out we, as humans, don't have other ways to investigate the human soul and the human mind of someone that is already dead. So that was the, the idea. And in, your, and, and in the novels that, have, that are in, based in 20th century history, was, was that a starting point that you wanted to understand the mind of, of a historical figure? Or? Yes, sometimes, and trying to understand certain philosophical or scientific problems through literature. Mm. Again, I think that literature is this tool for investigating reality with the same validity as science or as social sciences. Uh, only that our tool is fiction, is the imagination. And, and yes, uh, in, in Search of Klingsor, this novel about the German atomic project during World War II, led by this amazing physicist that was Werner Heisenberg. Yes, I, I tried to understand why he acted in the way he, he acted, uh, why he has accepted the post of being the head of this uh, nuclear program, why he didn't succeed at the end, and why he tried to conceal his involvement in politics during World War II. And again, even if history and historical investigation could lead us to understand a little bit what was happening at the time with the sources, the only way to try to understand the soul of Bernard Heisenberg is through fiction. Mm. I mean, one, one thing that, that comes across to me is that, uh, I mean, some, some novelists, I think, uh, use 
a theme or a historical time as, as the backdrop to the novel, but you don't get the sense that, that getting to the bottom of the truth of, of quantum physics or, 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 or whatever it is, is necessarily the, uh, so much of a driving force. And with, with you, I feel you really are investigating the, these, these things that come up in the novels. And I, I wondered whether, as a novelist, you, you then call on experts to help you as you write, or do you, do you just uh, research it in depth yourself and, and hope you get it right? Or I, I'm just curious, yes. for example, with the finance, the finance that comes into the, the last novel. Mainly not. <laughs> I, I think that almost I have to write a PhD dissertation for every novel of this cycle. <laughs> I did a lot of research. I read a lot of books and papers and uh, academic and scientific papers in order to try to understand the science or the discipline in question. Because for me, the idea was that history, the big history, but also each of the science that are involved in these four books are also characters of mm. the book. So I had to try to understand, if not all, because for example in science my mathematical abilities are not as good to understand completely the subtleties of each uh, problem and of each theorem, at least I could try to understand the general ideas of each formula and try to transform that into fiction. And that was the, the main problem for me writing these four different novels. Sometimes it was easier, for example, with psychoanalysis, it was easier than with uh, quantum physics or with economics. Mm. Uh, well, I, well, I was quite glad that in, in the Memorial del Engaño, at one point, a very complicated formula comes in. But then the, the author, Jay Volpe, says, look, you readers, you don't understand this stuff, so I won't try and explain it all. And I was, I w I was quite happy about that. <laughs> but, um, yes, in the book, he, he says, trying to make a joke, that if you understand the formula, you are one of the robbers in the world as he is. <laughs> right. <laughs> Only those who understand the formula of uh, derivatives in the economic world are involved in this awful crack that we had on 2007 and 2008. Yeah, I suppose we probably wouldn't be here here if we, you know, if we understood it, but I don't know. <laughs> I, so the the reason you're, you've been invited is because Mexico is, is the, the guest, the, the focus at the book fair. And I, I was curious because you, you've said that uh, in Mexican literature there is this sense of, uh, of, of tradition and continuity even more than, than rupture. And I wondered if there are some particular Mexican writers that you see yourself as following in, in their tradition particularly? And, and as a second part of the question, I suppose I'm curious uh, if there are if there are some other contemporary writers that that you or, you know that you would be recommending for people to to have a look at. But yes, yeah. of course. Well, the the main framework of this idea of rupture and continuity was uh, created by Octavio Paz himself. Uh, he was who thought that in the Mexican literature, literary tradition, there was this uh, tradition of rupture and continuity. So for me, that was very important at the time when I was starting to write. And for me, as for my generation and the younger generations, uh, at the time, it was very interesting to see that very different from other traditions, for example, the English tradition or the French tradition, or classicals in Latin America were very much alive at the time when we started reading and writing. Mm. So for us, Carlos Fuentes and Garcia Marquez and Vargas Llosa and Cortázar and Rulfo and Paz were our classicals. So it was amazing to be contemporary of uh, the classicals of our tradition. So that's why when we started this movement, the crack, 
we didn't try to oppose radically to them. We tried at the time to say that it was a misunderstanding that magical realism was the only way to be a Latin American writer. But at the same time, we admire very much the work of Garcia Marquez. So what we tried to do was to forget maybe the subject of the Garcia Marquez books, but to continue his struggle with language and to continue his struggle with the structure, very complex structure of his novels. Mm. And that was the same with the other Mexican writers that were very much alive at the, at the time. <clears throat> with Octavio Paz and, as a poet and essayist, uh, but with other writers of the same generation that are very important for us and not very well translated into English. <clears throat> well, for example, Elena Poniatowska that is here in this book fair, but with her writers as Salvador Elizondo, mm -hmm. as Juan Garcia Ponce, uh, as Inés Arredondo, and as Sergio Pitol, who is alive a little ill in Mexico right now. But finally being translated. Yes, finally being Deep translated. Vellum, published by Deep Vellum, yeah. Exactly. And of course, I would like to recommend not only the writers that are here now, the 11 or 10 or 15 writers that are here now in London for this book fair, uh, that are every one of them amazing and showing a piece of this puzzle that is right now in the Mexican literature, but also those who aren't here. For example, my very close friends, Ignacio Padilla, who is translated into English, Eloy Urroz, who is also translated into English, or Pedro Angel Palou. And from the same generation as mine, that is uh, born in the 60s, Mario Bellatin, who is an amazing author, Cristina Rivera Garza, mm -hmm. or David Toscana. And a little bit younger, Yuri Herrera, uh, Juan Pablo Villalobos, or uh, other writers, uh, for example, let me see, Guadalupe Nettel, Daniela Tarazona, who are not here this time mm. at the book fair. I think that just shows the, you know, the, the, the strength and breadth of Mexican literature, that there are so many good writers that, you know, that, that aren't here, for, um, and, uh, and as well as the great ones who are here, and yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting, I mean, uh, Yes, it's amazing to, to think that at the same time we have Elena Poniatowska and Sergio Pitol that are part of our classical tradition and as Elena writing new books at the same time as writers that were born in the 80s or 90s. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge tradition at the same time as the Borges Aleph. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for, for sharing a bit of that tradition with us, as well as an insight into your writing. Um, oh, thank you. And I, I, I hope we have some, some questions. <coughs> yeah. Oh, there's a microphone coming. If you, some, there we go. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in, in what you said, that, that the novel writing can be a way of finding, um, getting into somebody's soul and understanding him better. I'm a biographer, and I write biography when I want to get into somebody's soul and understand him better. So what do you think um, novel writing, what advantage does novel writing give you over biography, let's say? We use the same processes. I research and, and try to understand my subject as well as possible. Um, what is the difference? Well, I think it's a little bit the same. Uh, for a biographer, and I'm a reader of biographies, it's a genre that I love very much, and there are wonderful biographies that are also very literary, and we could read them as if they were novels. But at the same time, the biographer, as an historian, has to deal with the sources, always with the facts. And the very difference is that a novelist could imagine every space that is between a fact and another fact. We can try to understand a character not by, by 
what is stated in the facts in her or his diaries or memoirs or the other sources that a uh, historian could have to to deal to write a biography but also with his thoughts with emotions emotions and fiction is the only way to try to understand the thoughts and the emotions of uh, people and of the characters in, in, in a novel. Another question? Uh, thank you very much. And I haven't read your novels, and I must do immediately. Thank you. Um, you really do deal with some big questions, the history of, of the last century. But, and now it seems that you're still dealing with big questions, but through smaller incidents. Yeah. Why have you changed this focus? First part of the question. And second, there are some enormous questions still left. I mean, such as our changing climate, which many people say is one of the biggest challenges and most complex challenges facing mankind. Yeah. Um, and of course, as you said, all the other issues that you wrote about before are in interconnected. So really two questions. Why shift to the smaller, then well, to go to the big? And secondly, <laughs> this huge question. Thank you very much. Well, I haven't exactly shifted the focus on my writing because at the same time that during these two decades I have written these four big novels around these big subjects of the 20th and 21st century, I have also written small novels. I don't know why, but I don't write short stories anymore. Only big novels and short novels. This genre that is very different and, and uh, that I love very much indeed. So in the big novels, I try to deal with these big subjects. And with the smaller novels, it's also my idea to deal with subjects and themes that are less important in this global point of view, but that are very important for the characters of the books. So in this other line, I wrote a novel in aphorism that is called El Jardín Devastado, the ruined garden, about the pain of others, and a little bit about Iraq and the story of a woman in Iraq and the story of a, of a writer in Mexico. I wrote uh, another small novel that is called Dark with Dark, Oscuro Bosque Oscuro, that is also a novel in verse about genocides in the 20th century, but not about a particular genocide, but a, about how people that are neighbors become involved in genocides of the people that the way they were used to know in everyday life. And my third short novel in this other line is a love story uh, based upon two characters that were historical characters, but not important characters as on the other novels, a pair of lovers in the United States in Harvard University from 1920 to, 19, to the 60s. And the last one is this novel that I'm going to publish in September, this uh, novel about this family of traffickers, of women traffickers, that are settled in this very small town in the state of Tlaxcala that is called Tenancingo. A small town th that is the legend that since pre-Columbian times, was dedicated to raise prostitutes for their enemies, the Aztecs. So this story continues to be a, a very hard story. It continues to be a, a town where prostitution, child prostitution, trafficking of women continues to be a very difficult problem. And I decided to write that and to write that again in verse in 100 small chapters or poems to understand what was happening there uh, at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, unfortunately, our half hour is up. 
Um, but I, I do encourage you to have a look at Season, Season of Ash in the Foils bookstore. Jorge will be very happy, I'm sure, to, yes. to sign a copy. And, um, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. No, thank you very much.